Reach over to your bookshelf and pick up any book you have. It's one of two types, either hardcover or softcover. Softcover means the cover is made of a slightly heavier paper stock than the actual pages of the book, while hardcover books are a more substantial affair. Hardcovers are made by taking a stiff material, usually a thick piece of cardstock, though sometimes they are made of a lightweight piece of wooden veneer, and wrapping and gluing fabric, leather, or a strong durable paper over it. Some hardcover books come with a dust jacket that wraps around the cover to help protect it. In hardcover books, between the covers is what amounts to a stack of paper glued to the cover of the book by pasting in papers to both the stack of paper, called the book block or text block, and the front and back covers. The book block is stuck together by gluing groups of paper together along the spine edge. In soft covers, the whole book block and paper cover are glued together along the spine. The book block itself is comprised of a series of folios. A folio is a group of papers which are individually called leaves. There are usually eight leaves per folio, but it varies. These are folded over once, creating four surfaces for print on each leaf, called pages. The folded crease is sewn together in each folio to bind the folio together. Folios are then grouped and stacked together, held in a vise along the spine edge, and glued together with book paste. Paperback book blocks are assembled differently, and folios may or may not be present. The pages are often just glued into place as individual sheets and some cheaper production methods which leads to pages falling out easily if the gluing is insufficient. By the way, since folios are a fixed number of multiple leaves, usually around four to six or so, this explains why some books have a lot of blank pages at the end and others do not. It all depends on the length of the material being printed. If it requires only one page of a folio, you end up with all the remaining pages blank. But publishers usually manage to find a way to cover those pages with ads. By now, you're wondering why we're going to all this trouble to describe how books are made when our topic is supposed to be scrolls, and we can't blame you. We're beginning to wonder ourselves, but bear with us. Scrolls, in contrast to books, are long rolls of parchment or paper rolled up at each end and read out in loud proclamation to deliver the edicts of the ruling class to the illiterate masses. You've seen it done in any number of pseudo-medieval movies or TV shows. There's writing on them and everything, but usually the important bit is about five sentences in the middle of a scroll that is roughly nine miles long, to judge by the amount still rolled up on either spindle. Curiously though, as inaccurate as most entertainments are when dealing with things historical, that depiction does point up one of the difficulties of only having scrolls around on which to contain your writing. It's darned hard to find the bit you actually want or need to read, or reference two different parts of the manuscript on the long rolled up section. We're not talking about just a foot or two of parchment. The average scroll was about 15 feet long, but some scrolls could be a dozen meters long or more, depending on the length of the text they held. The Sefer Torah is a scroll around 140 to 150 feet long and contains the books of Moses from the Hebrew Bible. There isn't really a way to bookmark or index something like that that makes it convenient to use and easy to find what you want. Which is one reason the Romans invented the Codex, and we're certain you've been dying to know what the difference is between a Codex and a regular book. Well, it's easy. You made a Codex by very carefully accordion folding a scroll so that it displayed sections of text on a page-by-page -page basis. Then you attached the folded up scroll to wooden covers and spines and tied the whole thing together. Now you have a scroll that can be paginated, is protected enough to be durable and portable, and is easy to reference and get around in. A codex is a scroll in book form. And when you have a book, what you really have is a scroll made convenient. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Dungeons & Dragons has a sort of love-indifference relationship with magic items, and scrolls in particular. Their non-love reaction isn't strong enough to be called hate, but later editions of the game certainly aren't as in love with scrolls and details about them as the first edition of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons was. By the time 4th and 5th editions rolled around, a scroll was just another thing your friendly neighborhood magic user could use to avoid having to memorize a spell he or she might only use once in adventure. Meh. 
earlier editions, however, make quite the point of how involved scrolls were to create. It wasn't all just spend some time and some coin and presto poofo you had a scroll prepped to cast unbearable lightness of being. No, according to the earlier editions, you had to go to some effort. As you might expect, you couldn't make scrolls for spells you didn't already know. And heaven forbid you tried to create a scroll out of just any old stuff you had lying around. That way madness lay. If a wizard knows a spell, he can begin fabrication. His first step is to assemble the appropriate materials, quill, ink, and paper. These materials can't be commonplace items lest they mar the final product, or be consumed by the very magical energies the wizard seeks to inscribe. No, everything had to be special and of the finest qualities. Let's take a look at exactly what Gygax required for making scrolls, and what actually went on in the real world, just for funsies. The paper or other material upon which the scroll is inscribed must also be of fine quality. Paper is best for this purpose, followed by parchment and then papyrus. Which frankly is almost totally wrong. Papyrus, as you may be aware, was the first sort of paper available. It came from the papyrus plant, or rather, Cyperus papyrus, to give it its Latin name. And funnily enough, it's where the word paper came from, because papyrus was paper since forever ago. Maybe the problem is that we don't actually understand what paper is, and so we, and Gary, all think it's the stuff you get from mashing up trees or something. Which it is not. Or at least, that's not the only kind of paper. Paper is, and we quote somewhat, a thin material produced by pressing together moist fibers of cellulose pulp derived from wood, rags, or grasses, and drying them into flexible sheets. And papyrus is definitely one of those things. It's a sort of grass sort of reed that grows in shallow water. It's got a triangular stem topped with other smaller stems that give an overall impression of a feather duster. At one time, it was found all over the Nile River Delta in ancient Egypt, and several other places around the Mediterranean though in modern times it isn't cultivated nearly as much as it used to be, and so is in decline in those areas. You could make all sorts of stuff from papyrus, not just paper. The Egyptians made boats and baskets, sandals and blankets, even medicine and incense, all from papyrus. To make paper, though, you first had to remove the outer rind of the stems to reveal the sticky, fibrous inner pith. Then, either using a special glue or simply allowing the pith enough time to decompose slightly and become naturally adhesive, you'd lay out a batch of pith vertically on a stone or other hard surface and cover that with another layer horizontally, making sure to leave no gaps. Beating on the whole mess until it was nice and flat would turn it into a single solid sheet, which you would then set a weight on top of and allow it to dry. After that, polish it up with a stone or other hard object and cut it to size. Depending on what parts of the pith you used, you could produce different qualities of paper on which to write. From the rough, coarse outer layer of pith, you could make everyday paper, while the finer inner layers of pith produced a smoother, fine paper for more formal or official writing. Long scrolls of papyrus, as with other materials, were made by stitching or gluing consecutive sheets together to the required length. The distinction to be made between paper made from papyrus and paper made from other sources like old cloth or wood pulp was in the way they were made. Papyrus is made through a process of lamination, that crisscross method we just told you about, where successive layers are built up in alternating patterns. Wood pulp paper is made by a process of mastication, mastication, meaning to grind or crush. Once a fine mash of wood or cloth was achieved, it would be spread into a frame and allowed to dry. The thinner you spread it, the finer and thinner the resulting paper would be. These days, certain additives are introduced which produce different types of paper. In particular, clay can be added to the mix to produce extremely smooth or glossy paper, although some of the finest and most expensive writing papers are allowed to retain more roughness, which is called tooth. The general perception is that the heavier a single sheet of paper is, the more prestigious it is to write on. There is an upper acceptable limit, of course, to how rough and thick a paper could be and still be considered fancy before it simply became quaintly rustic. But we digress. Incidentally, you can make paper at home easily enough. Save up your dryer lint for a couple of weeks. Throw it in a blender or food processor with some water until it achieves a smooth consistency. Then spread it out on a sheet of parchment 
or strain it through a fine meshed wire frame until a consistent layer forms. Roll over it with a rolling pin to force water out and make a thinner layer. Then let it dry completely. You should end up with something about like construction paper, which is fun for the kids who are stuck at home to make and use. We've discussed before in our palimpsest episode how parchment was made and used. But to recap, take the hide of any animal you've got handy, clean it, lime it, stretch it, scrape it, and dry it. Now you have a parchment suitable for writing on. If you used calfskin, you could call your parchment vellum instead. Many official things were written on parchment because it tended to be more durable and kept longer. Also, it was a viable alternative to papyrus, which possibly was being monopolized in Egypt in the 5th century BC. They wanted it all, you see, because they had lots of little squiggly pictographs to write down, and gosh darn howdy, we just don't have enough to let the rest of the world have much at all. You know, unless you'd like to make us an offer we absolutely cannot accept, but why not try anyway? Go on! Eventually, parchment, and particularly the variant called vellum, was the de facto writing material for anything official, important, or legal. And shortly after that, because it was official and important, it became the preferred writing material for the rich and famous. If you wanted to impress people in the ancient world, you wrote on vellum. The finer, the better. So really, Gary's list should have been more like vellum is best, followed by parchment, then fine paper, and so on. But we can understand how that can get cumbersome and confusing in a hurry. On the subject of writing instruments for magical scrolls, the quill used for each spell must be fresh and unused. Lingering energies of the spell just transcribed cling to the quill. If the quill were used again, these energies would flow and intermingle with later attempts causing them to fail. Furthermore, the pen can't be just an ordinary goose quill. It must be from a strange and magical creature, perhaps one appropriate to the nature of the spell. The feather of a cockatrice for a flesh-to-stone spell. The task of gathering the right quill can be an adventure in itself. Now come on, even leaving aside the whole magical beasts and where to find them aspect of the rules, Gary is forgetting an entirely perfectly viable tradition for making scrolls that doesn't involve quills at all, from any creature. As early as, if not earlier than, 200 BCE, the Chinese were producing long scrolls of silk on which they would painstakingly hand paint their writings and art. Years would be spent learning calligraphy in an attempt to achieve the most beautifully formed characters to display on hanging scrolls throughout various buildings and homes. And it wasn't just one scroll and done. Scrolls were produced for and rotated through various seasons, with many being made for special occasions. It was very rare to see the same scroll hanging on a wall for an entire year. Eventually, scrolls were introduced into Japan to aid the spread of Buddhism, and they now take on important roles in both art and interior decoration in both China and Japan. Hanging wall scrolls weren't the only type of scrolls the Chinese developed, though. Smaller scrolls, called hand scrolls, were produced. Hand scrolls are long and narrow, and rather than being fully displayed all at one time vertically, they were intended for viewing section by section horizontally as they were unrolled on a table. Each hand scroll would depict a series of scenes relevant to Chinese culture, similar in effect to the way we view newspaper comic strips panel by panel today until the full work is revealed. Hand scrolls were never on display. They'd be brought out to be viewed and then immediately rolled up and put away again. As time went on, these scrolls, both wall and hand, went through a number of different styles and arrangements. Curiously though, the real styles that seemed to go in and out of fashion related mostly to how they were displayed, or more specifically, to how they were mounted for display. Meant to show off or highlight certain elements of the scroll, these mounts varied in terms of the number of colors they used on the mounting, from one to three, and in slight variations of pattern, as well as the type of display the scroll was intended to make, from hall decoration to panoramic scenes to couplets, which were two hanging scrolls side by side showing poetic calligraphy. It just seems like such a shame that Gary didn't consider centuries of culture and artistic effort when deciding how magic scrolls could and couldn't be made. Just writing the words down with a special pen seems like an easy out compared to the years of learning it takes to do proper calligraphic painting. And arguably, it's more in the spirit of the older editions to have insisted on some skill in calligraphy for scroll creation. 
The third and final component for making scrolls is, of course, ink. You've got to have something to write the spell in, naturally. In this area, the DM has the greatest leeway to demand the most exotic ingredients and processes. The ingredient could be simple, the ink of a giant squid mixed with the venom of a wyvern sting, or the musk of a giant skunk brewed with the blood of a gorgon. It could also be complex in meaning, the tears of a crocodile and a drop of water from the bottom of the deepest ocean, or a drop of mead from the cup of King Thias, blended with the lamentations of the women from the funeral of a great hero. In general, the ink's ingredients should relate to the overall purpose of the scroll. As with the quill, the ink required for each spell should be different, and even each inscription of the same spell requires the batch to be brewed anew. After the character has gathered and brewed all the materials, he can begin the actual process of writing. Now Gary sure had a way with words. On the one hand, he lets you demand exotic ingredients. On the other, he tells you they can be simple. And then... As an example of simple ingredients, he suggests giant squid ink and wyvern venom. We're not really sure Gary understood what simple means. The history of ink goes back so far, we aren't even sure where it began or how far back it actually goes. We know Egypt had ink from at least the 26th century BCE, and Chinese inks are reckoned to be at least three or four millennia old, at least into their Neolithic period. What really matters, though, is that archaeological evidence suggests that the earliest ink, and therefore the simplest, was developed independently by each and every ink-using culture. It was made from what we now call lamp black or carbon black, which is just a fancy way of saying soot. If you burn a thing, usually something oily or petroleum-based, and it doesn't get enough oxygen, it produces a sooty flame, which is basically unburnt carbon that can be collected by holding something over the flame until it becomes black. The glass chimneys of oil-burning lamps are great collection sites for this stuff. Scrape off a quantity of this lamp black, mix it in proper ratios with some kind of animal glue, possible candidates include egg whites, gelatin, or various hide glues, and you've got an ink of sufficient darkness and persistence to be worth writing with. For years, as we mentioned, this was the go-to ink in use wherever ink was in use. The Chinese had so much of it and used it so regularly that they turned it into ink sticks, which is ink made to the above formula and allowed to harden and solidify in a mold. The ink would be re-wetted and swished around with a brush until it was ready for use again. It doesn't fade over time and won't harm the paper it's used on. So good are carbon-based inks that odds are your printer still uses them except that the carbon is now in the form of nanotubes and a polymer is used to suspend the ink rather than animal glue. Gradually, by rough experimentation, other things turned out to produce useful colors too. Mostly things you could smash or crush. You know, bugs, berries, leaves, hopes and dreams, that kind of thing. By grinding a mixture of hide glue, carbon, and lamp and bone black pigments, the Chinese developed India ink, so named because some of its ingredients were imported from India. The Romans eventually worked out that you could take oak galls, sometimes called oak apples, but really a wound on the oak tree caused by a gall wasp trying to lay eggs in developing oak leaf buds. You could take oak galls, grind and crush them up, mix them with iron salts and a thickener, and produce an ink that starts black but fades to dark brown over time. Suddenly, it was all the rage, and by the 12th century, nearly everyone was using iron gall ink. The problem was, in spite of its popularity, it turns out ink made this way is just about the worst ink you could use if what you wanted to do was, for example, have documents that would last through the years. Not only does it eventually fade out into unreadability, it also damages the paper you put it on, corrodes the metal nibs of any pen not designed specifically to use it, and itself becomes brittle and liable to flake off the page. Many important works of music and literature were written with iron gall ink, and these are now being lost to time and an inability to satisfactorily preserve documents written with it without potentially destroying the document itself. Original box scores are decaying away in front of everyone's eyes and nothing can be done about it. Today, inks come in a huge variety of colors, styles, and applications. Which one you use depends on what exactly you want to use it for. The formulation of these inks varies depending on what it should do. For making magical scrolls, presuming you haven't got a jar of dragon squeezings handy, many exotic inks are available for fountain pens and, by extension, quill pens. 
Some are, as you'd expect, strong primary colors in the usual spectrum. Others, though, are far more fanciful. Inks are made which contain microscopic metal flakes, giving them an unprecedented sheen and glitter-like appearance when dried. Others are designed to be unerasable by any means, not just indelible, but unremovable and inseparable from the document they appear on. One company even boasts an ink that can only be removed by laser. Why would you want such an ink? Well, it used to be the practice that forgers could wash a check, removing the ink showing the dollar amount of the check. Then they would simply fill in whatever amount they desired and cash it as if it had always carried that amount. But with inks like these, often called bulletproof, that can't happen. The variety of modern inks is pretty amazing. Some fluoresce, some turn out in multiple colors at once, and other inks even glow in the dark which should satisfy even the pickiest of Gygaxes and meet all your magical scroll-scribing needs. But you can make your own inks at home, too. Just take half a cup of any strongly colored berry, either fresh or frozen, press them through a strainer or fine sieve to separate the juice from the rest of the berries, add half a teaspoon of vinegar and half a teaspoon of salt, and you've got an ink good enough to use with cotton swabs and toothpicks that will retain its color and be permanent. And then you can just go ahead and make all the magical scrolls you want, regardless of what Gary has to say about it. We sure hope you and yours are doing well. We're all fine here so far. Thanks for hanging in there and listening to the show when and where you can. We know that for many of you, not having a commute at the moment means you don't have your usual amount of time to listen to podcasts. No worries. We'll be here when things get back to normal. Whatever that is. Hello, friends! I know we're not in French or anything, and we're sure it's painfully obvious that we have no idea how to pronounce things French. But we like you all the same. All 20 or so of you who listen from there. Plus a few others here and there. Hang in there. As usual, a special thanks and shout out to our patrons on Patreon. You keep making it happen, and we'll keep putting episodes together. Did you know we do a monthly chat with our patrons? We talk about show stuff and ideas for future episodes and whatever else happens to cross our minds. It usually takes about an hour, and we'd love to have you join us. Head over to our website at gmwordoftheweek.com and follow the yellow banner at the top for the details on how to do that. We look forward to talking with you. This episode has been researched, written, and produced by yours truly, Brian Casey. Blue Dot Sessions made the music for this episode. They've got a lot of good stuff you can check out at sessions.blue. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. <laughs>